Hello, um, everyone. Um, thank you so much for uh, coming to join um, myself um, today for this very, um, I think, really important evening for Maggie's. And you know, many of you have been long-term uh, loyal supporters of our work in supporting people um, affected by cancer. Um, but when um, John Jenks showed me this film, The Forgotten Sea, I felt it was so important that um, I had an opportunity to share this with you. And I hope um, before coming to join this conversation about the making of the film, that you've all had a, a chance to, um, to watch it. Um, it has been the most difficult of times for many people, but particularly for those affected by cancer. And before COVID, we knew that 450 people a day with cancer die. Um, but as we went into the COVID, um, people were hidden away, shielded. Many people with cancer had their treatment stopped or altered. And I think as this film is entitled The Forgotten Sea, they felt forgotten because the tension for a period of time um, uh, turned completely to COVID. And I think what, what moved me so much about this film is I found it very difficult to articulate the stories that I've been hearing from people with cancer and to sort of do it justice to the distress and anxiety, aloneness, um, the sense of abandonment that people have talked to many of Maggie's staff and have shared with myself. And when I saw this film, it sort of did all of that. It sort of articulated the real harrowing challenge that COVID has posed for people with cancer. And so I'm delighted tonight that um, we're joined by two very special guests, um, John Jenks, who is a wonderful um, friend of Maggie's, um, a, a friend of mine, and, and obviously has been a supporter and has watched Maggie's um, sort of grow up. Um, John um, hasn't been able to get online um, at the moment, um, so he will be joining us just shortly and I'll be able to share um, his um, thoughts about the making of the film because the backdrop to the film was a series that he made called The, um, the um, Uncertain Kingdom, um, which he commissioned last year, which was a series of, of 20 films. And when COVID came along, uh, John decided to make one special additional film called, um, called The Forgotten Sea. And I'm joined um, um, also today by Jesse, who fortunately is with us. And Jesse, wrote this film and co-produced it with her fellow producer, um, Molly. So I wonder if, um, before I, I move to Jessie, just to ask her a few questions about the making of the film, I just wanted to say that I hope that um, today we will be online for about an hour. Um, I would really love and welcome your questions. And if you could um, just look at the icon with the question mark in it, if you could write your question, um, then the sort of second half of our um, being together, um, I would like to put your questions directly to Jesse and um, and John. So if I, I if I might start, if I could go to Jesse, um, thank you so much for uh, joining us this evening, and and Jesse, thank you um, for giving us a chance to see this film before it um, is um, it goes uh, it premiered in um, I think a couple of days time from now. Um, I just wanted to ask you. It feels like a very personal film. Um, was it personal for you? Yeah, so it was a bit of a a kind of serendipitous moment, really, as um, I, well, so my, so I did chemo and finished the end of 2019 um, and have basically, my kind of plan has then been to have three monthly scans to check that the chemo had worked. So I'd had my first scan in January and that had been clear um, and then was due the second one in April. Um, that got cancelled um, because of COVID and I was then rescheduled for end of July um, to have my next one. But I think sometimes I think now having had cancer for about a year and a half you kind of get a bit of an instinct I think when you and I just had a really a kind of bad feeling um so I pushed and pushed and pushed to get this scan um and I do worry about 
people who don't necessarily feel like they can do that. But um, I ended up getting the scan in May. So it was kind of like peak lockdown. Um, and the scan unfortunately showed that the chemo hadn't really worked or hadn't worked very well. Um, and the cancer had come back. Um, so it had metastasized and is now on my liver. Um, so this we obviously got this news in the middle of lockdown um, and there was about they sort of told me over the phone and said that they needed to kind of decide what to do so we had about me and my partner had about a, a week where your mind just kind of went completely to the yeah. worst place um, and we just had this week of just absolute hell where we just kind of thought maybe this is it like maybe if they've given me the strongest chemo that we know of and that can work and that hasn't worked like what's going to happen it's on my liver completely panicking and I guess obviously that heightened by the fact that I was shielding because of um, Covid and the fact that I wasn't that long out of chemo so we weren't seeing any family or friends um, living quite a small flat in London and we're just sort of pacing around and I just it was just absolute despair just thinking because I think if you've got you know advanced and curable terminal cancer what makes it um what makes you at least kind of feel better I think is when you think do you know what I will just do everything I wanted to do I will just go and live life to the full so that the sense of being trapped but also potentially facing that was just like almost kind of too much to bear and then the uncertain kingdom I ended up seeing um that they were commissioning this 21st film um and the brief was a unique perspective on the pandemic. And I think I even saw it as I was kind of sitting at this table that, that I'm sitting on now, kind of looking out the window. Um, and I just thought, this is a unique perspective. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, I, yeah, I guess kind of just thought, thought it through and just thought, I was very much thinking about it at that point as like, what would happen if this was my last few months? Um, and imagining kind of my friends and family as happens in the film have to kind of come to the street and do these like kind of really important conversations at a distance and not being able to sort of physically be yeah. with people um and then molly is um an old friend of mine um so we've known each other since we were 14 uh and she's you know i mean an incredible director who puts amazing cinematography on everything and I just thought she's going to be a great person I think to work with on this and kind of bring it to life um so I chatted to her and then yeah together we just sort of I think she brought you know all that she knows about like not that I don't know about cameras but she obviously has a very great eye and we kind of worked it out and hashed it out together like how it would work and what would happen um and we both agreed from the start that we thought um she does have to die I think because because people were and people yeah. were having people were dying or having to face dying in that situation um so yeah that's <laughs> around that um, situation. Desi I think um I mean I think if um John had um what he's told me about he's he's been a huge admirer about of you as a writer and and a maker and I think um was sort of so delighted when you um, put in the submission for the 21st film because I think he'd always wanted to make one of your works so so you were already this writer you were already um, 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 writing scripts H how long did it take you to write this one because that's you know it's been a very short period of time um, there's Covid window you've had this news and here you are with a finished beautiful um, completed film um, so it I think you might be talking about Molly when you, as much as I'd love to think John always wanted to work with me, no, I think he was admiring Molly, I think he knew about all of Molly's works, but um, hopefully he's enjoyed working with me as well. Um, but um, it took, well I guess we were kind of, because the submission process there was a few different stages, um, I guess we were kind of like developing it as we went. Um, and then we actually only started fully writing it in like script form once we knew that we'd got it. Um, I think potentially in my head, I think I, I probably could have started to do some, but I think I just would have found it too heartbreaking if we hadn't got it and I'd started writing it. Um, and then from that, it was actually very quick, like it didn't take us very long at all. I think it was one of those sort of scripts and ideas, I think that because it was so 
kind of based on reality that it just sort of flowed out like it didn't ever feel like we were sort of struggling with it or wasn't weren't really sure what to do um so it was a pretty I think it maybe three weeks I think from like putting kind of pen to paper and then getting it kind of like the final script can I am I can you hear me oh yes we can hear you John (laughs) (laughs) sorry Um, it's fantastic that you've arrived, John. Um, we, we, as you, I hope you've just caught a bit about um, Jesse telling us um, about the, um, the, the the timing of making um, um, this film, and also in the in the um, and and during this kind of acute COVID time, and and her getting her own news about um, her cancer. And um, John, I think if I if I can, I'd just I'd love to just go back a step because I think those listening, I think would really love to hear um, about the Forgotten Kingdom and about what led you to make that um, series of of twenty um, films. And and I've watched, I've not watched all twenty of them, but I've watched a number of them. Um, the one, the conversations for me was particularly, I mean, you did that before um, the Black Lives Matters kind of was was impactful over COVID. And um, and then obviously you went on to commission this very special 21st film. So pl- please tell us about um, The Uncertain Kingdom. I'm, I'm sorry for everyone that, that you've managed to start and now we have to go back and um, provide a bit of context. But um yeah, I managed to get all of Jessie's and what she was talking about. And I was actually sitting there not wanting to interrupt because um, I was so interested in what she was saying. Um, the Uncertain Kingdom um, came to me um, as, you know, the great history of having ideas in the bath um, from Archimedes onwards. Um, I was sitting there and it was announced that uh, we were going to have a festival of Britishness to bring us all together um, after Brexit and to try and heal all the divides. And this was in November 2018. And I thought that's a really good idea. We need to have something that does um, engage and get, you know, all these stories out there. But right now, a sort of festival of celebration isn't exactly what we need. And um, my feeling about the great what cinema is really good at as opposed to every other art form is giving you the opportunity to have a subjective someone else's share in someone else's subjective experience um and i thought if we can have 20 short films each with their own subjective experience maybe we can cry and bash up against this idea that we're all in these bubbles and we're all denying each other's experience. So I wanted to make 20 short films that each had a different point of view about what was going on in Britain in 2019, because I don't know if people can put their mind back to 2018, but back in the heady days of 2018, it looked like 2019 was gonna be the big year. Um, and how naive we were in, the, in, in, in everything that's happened to us in 2020. Um, anyway, so we're making these 20 films all about um, Britain in uh, 2019. And we had them all ready to be released. Um, in uh, March, we had 200 cinemas that were going to Uh, take them on which is an amazing first short films and um, it was going to be released on the 22nd of March um, this year which yeah is I I think two days after lockdown happened (laughs) Um, so that plan went up in smoke and um, we had a sort of phased release and our next phase of release we wanted to do these um, community screenings whereby Anyone, whether it was a pub or a, or a library or an old people's home or a prison, chose five or six of the films. And then after the screenings of the films, anyone in the audience could stand up and speak for a minute about the films. You know, going back to this idea of sharing subjective experiences. And so we thought, OK, how do we launch that as a new idea? And we thought, OK, we need to do a 21st film um, that no one's seen that, 
you know, brings everything up to date and, and makes it essential again. I, you know, with the, the 20 films, I would say, you know, they are still relevant. They're all, all the themes of homelessness, Black Lives Matter, um, Brexit, all these things are waiting for us once we've got out of the current COVID situation. Um, I completely and, agree, John. None of those yeah. um, issues have gone away. So wh when you had the idea of, of commissioning something to sort of represent this period of, of COVID time, what, what made you choose this story that Jesse had, had written? I'm so great. So I've got, I've got, I've got two business, uh, I've got two partners with the Uncertain Kingdom um, who are absolute heroes, um, Isabel Freer and Georgia Goggin. And we, we went out and we did that. We, we told our thousand Twitter followers and we told, and they told another probably 5,000 people. Um, and we got, you know, a lot of applications and I have, to, you know, I hate to say it to everyone else who applied, but we all read Jesse's application and we're like, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> we went at it and I'm very much, you know, because of my, you know, involvement with Maggie's and my experiences, fam familial experiences with cancer and, and that sort of thing. I'm very resistant to my, I try and be as disinterested as possible. And I kept saying, no, 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 we've got to let other people in there because because we've got it, you know, and it may just be my own personal preference. And I'm trying to be as objective as possible. And objectively, it just was the best. <laughs> so <laughs> um, um, it was it was moving. You know, we'd seen some of I've seen lots of Molly's work before. The, the story was poignant without being um, sentimental. Um, there was a great story behind it's everything you want in a film it just you know and we knew that they could do it we knew that they could pull it off and yeah no question about it I'm, I'm so grateful John that you you did choose uh, choose um, Jesse's film because I think it is going to be one of the pivotal um, uh, films actually, I think, bears witness to the impact of COVID on, on people with cancer. And it's, it, it, as I say, it's been almost impossible to find the, the words and the language to describe how, um, how traumatising and harrowing this, this time has been and, and continues to be. And in particular, um, with the, the further sort of lockdowns that are coming and people with cancer are very fearful about what that means for their diagnosis and treatment and, and survivability. But I think one of the other things about this film, and, and Jesse, I'd, I'd love to just ask you, it also highlighted, um, I think, some of the issues that were drawn out during COVID about the impact um, within the, the, the BAME community. And was that something that you particularly wanted to sort of um, bear witness to? Um, yeah, no, it was definitely a very conscious decision um, to have, we didn't want to kind of be too prescriptive, but we just knew that we did want it to be someone who was from um, an ethnic minority background because it was because of COVID and the dad character particularly, we just, we really wanted to get like a kind of the sacrifices that key workers have made and we wanted to get that into the film but without it being sort of too random or like feel like it was forced in um and then the more we kind of thought about it the more we thought actually like using him as a character as a device can also um kind of reiterate the really hard decisions about that people in real life with people who um with loved ones with cancer are facing because it's like that constant sort of you know time is precious do you just go actually we're going to be together or actually do you go no covid's more of a risk than cancer and we're not going to and i think his character was all about kind of playing you know tr flipping back and forth between trying to decide what was the right thing to do or not and then ultimately obviously it's her that kind of breaks that wall um and goes yeah. out um and then the other but aside from COVID, it was also because um, in the cancer world, um, I'd been to, so Saima, who the film is yeah. dedicated to, who actually 
died a week before the shoot, um, which made it feel, you know, obviously very real and even more real than it kind of was. But um, she, I, she was actually the first um, kind of like young cancer patient that I met. Um, and we weren't close friends or anything, but she was kind of this the first person I met, and it was at um, her cafe that she ran, and she'd put on an event which was basically um, kind of giving a space to people of colour but also people who were kind of you know like me who wanted to go and listen and learn to basically just share stories and share experiences and kind of share frustrations about you know I mean the list was kind of endless of like stuff that had you know happened and stuff that they had felt and experienced but um, like systemic issues that kind of bleed into the everything that the Black Lives Matter movement encompassed, but also um, representation and that in kind of cancer communications, cancer charities, there wasn't that much representation and that that then fed into kind of the taboo and stigma around it. Um, and Saima talked so brilliantly about it and did so much kind of advocacy around it that it was just kind of a no brainer that we wanted it to be someone like her the character so she did very much inspire the character um and actually it was funny in the in the interview that we had with the uncertain kingdom um they also said which i hadn't actually thought about but um they referenced the fact that maybe it would also be good for me to have a bit of distance from that character um just because it was quite a hard thing to do and I think that was actually right even though I hadn't thought about it maybe that was kind of a subconscious element because everything else like the set was my flat uh the street was my street um the neighbors in the film are my real neighbors they're not actors um ah, now you're revealing <laughs> Jesse now you're revealing some of your real secrets into the the, 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 the the people that participated in the film I mean what was what I think um so I watched your film and then saw that uh, Samia was was who you were paying tribute to and um, she played a has played a, a pivotal role in Maggie's in helping make sure that we understand as an organization our responsibilities and um so that we are better at helping people from different um, cultural backgrounds that, that some of our staff may not necessarily sort of understand. But I think I think you really played on the, so if we take a theme, The Father, which for me was the, and I, I've watched the film about four times, and it is the one that just really, mm. just, just gets you. Because I, I could see my own father, you know, trying to be brave, trying to be distant, trying to be um, not what you know not wanting to admit um, that there was a finality um, uh, and in a way the mixture of then COVID coming in to keeping that separation I thought was was even it was just so painful and and um, to, 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 to watch. Yeah no I think that was and I think you're right that I think it partly why he is so moved I mean he's my favourite character and those are my favourite scenes because I think and I mean when we were shooting it um we were all I mean he was amazing I don't know how he brought that because he like say Mandeep who was also obviously amazing had been there kind of for the whole shoot for the two days whereas um Anil had only come in for sort of he only really had kind of a half day with us and the emotion that he brought even though he hadn't kind of been there um we were all sort of on the street just all crying at the monitor trying not to distract him because <laughs> he just like and I think you're right, it is, um, it is something I think about, and it's not just like fathers, but I think it's particularly parents mm -hmm. when it's someone young. I think there is probably more than most, like a big sense of denial about how serious it is because it's almost too kind of painful to really accept. Um, and I think, at the end actually the fact that she then breaks that wall and like he obviously does need it I think kind of just makes that even more and actually the other funny thing that I don't know whether you remember but the first scene with him when the motorbike comes that wasn't planned at all and it was um but he he just held his kind of like emotion and when we were going in the edit we were like actually like at the time it seemed like oh the motorbikes ruined it but when we were looking at it, we were like, wow, it actually even more amplifies that kind of, you know, they 
want to be close but they can't and they've tried there's so yeah. many like n conversations that aren't being said in their words and then the motorbike the way it comes in I think just like amplifies that kind of awkwardness um, yeah. And jo John, I think it was one of the comments that you were making earlier about what film can show. For me, there was that bittersweet moment where um, where um, um, she, they were looking out the window and it was obviously the end of lockdown and there was a speech being made about, you know, freedom and, um, and everyone having a sort of toast. And you just went to um, them both just clasping each other's hands realising that, that, that the freedom that the, the, the people in the street that were, were being offered was not the freedom that they were going to experience, both the lockdown ending freedom or the end of of, uh, of, of cancer being sort of released. So I think for me... I think that that's one of um, Jesse's great and, 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 and Molly's great skill in this is, is using sort of what I would call dramatic irony in such a, a delicate way. And, you know, you... you you set up a sort of mesel zen and, and you, you know exactly what's going on with um, the crowd of people down below. And then you just do something very simple and slight um, that, that slips that into a different perspective and just shows you um, how your main characters are experiencing that moment. And it's that it's that very amazing subtlety and um, poignancy of the film that I think, you know, is, is really, it shows really good filmmaking. And yeah. really, you know. There's so much in life, isn't it? There is unspoken. And so to have those, those silences, those, those moments where you can actually just, again, witness the emotion without it actually having to be verbally e e expressed, I, I thought was one of the most, um, um, for me, that was the most interesting. And then uh, one of the other things, I think, Jesse, that every person with the, who who comes into a Maggie Centre talks about the frustration of their families wanting to feed them and wanting to fatten them up and wanting to um, nourish them. And um, I, I'm sure that must have happened to you that you couldn't resist putting turmeric and uh, and lots of food at your at your doorstep. Yeah, no, I did. <laughs> I just couldn't resist because it sort of. And for me, it was more about, because to be, to be fair, I actually do, you know, I, I think there are, I actually do really believe in the kind of like holistic approach to dealing with cancer. Like, I, I think it's where like cure kind of comes in that I struggle with, but I think to give yourself a better quality of life and potentially a better prognosis. But um, I think what that was about is it's the, it's the kind of constant like p other people doing it whereas like it should be whatever way you go whether it's to just go fuck it I'm just going to do what I want or whether it's going to be the turmeric way that is your decision and I think it can be quite kind of exhausting when people are constantly sort of going why don't you try this uh, you know a bit like it kind of reminds me a little bit of what people with depression must go through when people are kind of going <laughs> try some exercise what about trying if you eat some healthy food that would be better and you just want to go no it's not gonna like and you kind of know that it's probably going to make it better but the yeah. root cause is still there but I think what was lovely about how you showed it was that everyone in a way just allowing people to find their role their way of contributing yeah. their way yeah. of, of um, being part of it um I've got some more questions that I I, I would like to come back to Jesse and John um uh, in a bit too but I wonder if I could move just to asking some of the questions that have come in and um, I've got a question here for you, Jesse. Um, um, it's anonymous, I can't tell you it's from, but um, I thought the cinematography was so beautiful and really poignant. Um, what was it about the story that influenced the way you filmed it? Um, That's a good question. And um, So I think the, the key thing for us was, I'd probably say like two things. One was, um, the emphasizing the kind of two different worlds like the outside and the inside and how it, it really like and this was sort of based off my experience of lockdown because it, on the road there felt like there was this whole it did really feel like there was like a whole other world outside and then me and Rob my partner were in this other world inside going through obviously shielding and not being able to go out um but also obviously dealing with this news and this trauma and it, it was then really jarring sometimes when we would say join for the NHS clap 
sort of from our window and then I, the, the street just had no idea sort of what was going on I don't think and it that was a big thing I think that we wanted to emphasize with the cinematography which was also why it was so important that final scene when she does break the wall um mm. and the second thing that we really wanted to emphasize was the kind of like claustrophobia um of it and the fact that it really needed to be we felt like it really needed to be from that perspective so everything should be you know only from the window and we shouldn't really ever go to other places in the house um and it should always be this sort of her looking down um and emphasizing i guess that distance and how everybody just kind of wants to come in um but they can't and it's that constant like Ugh. and um, you thought that it, sorry, John, you go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, Jesse, you, you spoke a lot when we were actually in your pitch about seeing her in silhouette a lot mm. and not, you know, and not really going for her, you know, loads of emotive close ups of her mm. um, and just, you know, sort of edging the frame a lot and, and making her feel. And so I think um sorry you know one of the things that really does is it, it, it you know when you do get moments of her you really reach out and try and mm. get as much of her as you can and that sort of that reaching sense of trying to to get sort of see who she is and sort of try and peer around the corner to get as much out of her as a character I think mm. yeah really I think that and, yeah and John one of the things that again Maggie's heard of throughout this um COVID period was was from the family members who, um, you know, who had, you know, they couldn't go into hospital, they couldn't um, see a health professional, they felt very sort of separate and removed from um, everything. Um, and so they just had to be this, 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 this family member, but without really feeling that they could participate in, in helping their person with cancer. And I think, I, I think what you really again um, showed Jesse was just an impact on the friend, the sister, the father, the mother, and that tension that her and, and Jamie experienced when there was an invitation for the mum to come and sleep. And um, and it's not all plain sailing and lovely. And I think you just you just brought in those tensions. I think so 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 subtly, but they're 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 real. Yeah. No, that was actually a very good I think a really good piece of feedback we had in our first draft script that I think the first one we did like it maybe I think we maybe made Aisha and Jamie a bit too like everything was plain sailing um and then I had to kind of draw on some of the yeah the kind of I guess like <laughs> difficult moments which obviously there are um and yeah I think you're right that it always kind of feels especially if you're the cancer patient you've kind of got this like swirling around you and everybody bringing their own you know some people want to be really positive some people want to be really realistic some people want to be you know there as well and also that you know especially when I think you have a partner and your parents there's sometimes a bit of attention about like Absolutely. they're mine, <laughs> they're mine. <laughs> um so yeah no I think that they were just as important but also obviously the other thing I always have to remember is that they are living it too like they're living the camp they they it's almost like they have it as well um but i guess it's just a different but I, in this i mean as i say in this 15 minute film um thereabouts i mean you packed in all of the different kind of people that are impacted on the person who's got got cancer and um and, and John, I, I, I've had a question that um, has come in for you, and and it really is about um, how you know how did your mum go about setting up um, sort of Maggie's and, and 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 why she went about setting up Maggie's. And I think this, I don't know about you, but I think this film sort of expresses why she felt it was needed, don't you? Um, I yeah, I, well, I, that's a that's <laughs> such a big question. <laughs> Um, and it goes back to you know me as a, a 14 year old boy um which is a long time ago um it's um i you know i i feel you know something actually i spoke to jesse about early on was the title of the film and it being the forgotten sea mm -hmm. and talking about 
when my mum had, you know, cancer, it was the era of the big C. Um, and that, that and people wouldn't talk about it. And it was a sort of crushing defeat. And, you know, and, and it was a death sentence. And, you know, my mum in the view from the front line, you know, spoke a lot about that. Um, and um, and it's interesting how that sort of seen us for Jesse's, I, you know, I may be wrong, but for isn't quite as 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 a big phrase in it isn't the big C so much for Jesse's generation I don't know and mm -hmm. maybe and but that kind of community that forms around the main character in the Forgotten Sea means that is what I think Maggie's is trying to do and um, what my mum wanted people to be able to my mum was a very social um very engaged very community uh very energetic person and um i think that kind of that kind of experience of cancer you know she didn't want people to 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 have it as a death sentence i, I sorry that's not entirely uh no I, but um, I, I hope it's a, yeah. I, I, so i think they do um or, like my experience of them um so i actually was really lucky that where i did chemo was there is a maggie's um so at charing cross hospital um which is maggie's west london i believe um and because the chemo that i did was very so for part of it i had to sort of stay as like a inpatient for um for five days where i sort of was like with my infusion for about eight hours a day um and it was just such a like escape because you I would just basically before it started and but when it end like well no I would it would never end in time for me to go so I'd always do it in the morning um and just having it there I think because you do fit and because I think the hospital just strips you so much and you just always feel like a patient I think um and I think just being able to just go into a space that was like there and it was sort of safe and everybody kind of knew what, you know, I had my headscarf on and it was kind of obvious why I was there. But it just felt like, you know, you're coming in as a, a person in a place that understands. And often I wouldn't really even do anything other than like make myself a tea, chat to some of the staff at the kitchen and then go in a room and read. But it just felt so nice to go and be able to read somewhere like that in a building rather than on your hospital bed with all the patients and all the nurses and stuff um yeah that was just my experience of it sorry I don't really know what that was related to <laughs> but I thought I'd share it anyway <laughs> I, I, well I, I absolutely think that the title um Forgotten Sea is is a really powerful and strong and I actually wondered whether or not you were uh, playing on a bit of the forgotten you know because it's COVID you know see cancer and I do I think you're right John in that um, we've been heading over the last few years where you know we think we've got cancer sort of sorted and as I said at the beginning of um, uh, here you know before COVID 450 people a day would you know still die of cancer and because of COVID it's anticipated that there could be an excess of um, and the, the, the figures are, are, are not clear, but anything between 35,000 and 65,000 over the next, you know, five years could die as a result of, of how COVID has impacted on their treatment. So um, we, we mustn't forget about, um, a, a, about cancer. Um, I'm going to go to another question. Um, um, it says, um, as Laura has said, I think your film um, will be incredibly important. It's brilliant. You packed in so much. Um, but it also managed to get a sense of how time was uh, dragging, as it must have been the situation. How did you achieve that, the dragging? Did you feel the time dragging? <laughs> um, and, that's a really good question. I'm glad that you yeah, think you feel that you live six months in isolation. Yeah, I, th I think it. I'm glad that you think that because that's what we wanted to because it was I mean, it was really hard to like put it into 15 minutes but then actually now I look at the film I'm like I feel like it's perfect for 15 minutes how we've done it but um I don't know I think it's maybe something about being in that same space all the time that like and also 
I remember me and Molly sort of saying like we you know we'd have to get kind of cutaways from you know from the window to kind of show time passing yeah. and we'd have to make sure that they were day night dusk to kind of make sure because obviously the shoot would was mainly in the day so and it was the same weather so we obviously didn't want it to and the, 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 the man coming out in the morning with his baby to put his rubbish in the bed yeah. <laughs> you know, again you could just feel that, that was a daily occurrence you know and yeah I think that was because I guess that's it. We were still in, like, we were kind of still in lockdown pretty much when we filmed it. Um, like, stuff had eased a little bit. But um, I remember it was still, it wasn't, it definitely wasn't, say, like, how it felt in August. Like, I remember me and, and this is kind of going into one of the other questions that I saw, but um, which was, what is it like filming with the threat of COVID and having not finished chemo that long before? And that, that was difficult, like, because we, I obviously made it as COVID safe as I could and we had like hand sanitizer stations before anybody could come in like obviously we limited the amount of people in the house everybody wore masks but it, it I kind of had to balance being like do you know what to me this is worth yeah. it and if I do everything I can but then me and Rob would literally people would leave and or people left after the shoot and we were up literally scrubbing everything with antibacterial wipes <laughs> till like 1am just mm -hmm. trying to get every surface and thinking would this even do anything like I don't know if there was someone with Covid but it, it kind of psychologically I think made us feel like we'd sort of sanitised everything and luckily you know no one had Covid and we were all fine but um, it was I did have to kind of go Take it weigh down. it up a bit and go I'm just going to have to take this slight risk like everybody is. Um, but also I was six months out of chemo by that point, which had kind of been what my oncologist had said, you know, at that six month point, you kind of your immune system's at least partly recovered. Um, so I wouldn't have done it, you know, maybe in March or April. Um, I, I've um, just got a question for myself about how did Maggie um, help folks like um, um, Aisha and her, her family during um, lockdown. Well, we, our centre stayed open, um, but we did most of our work. We did some face to face work for people who were in the hospital and who couldn't see their family and friends. Um, they were able to meet in the Maggie's during um, that hospitalisation period. Um, but we did um, telephone support and this new way of communicating that we've got here tonight of psychologists and benefits advisors and cancer support specialists talking to people um, via via Zoom and the centres have now been open and and seeing people and I think one of the one of the biggest things since the kind of ease of the major lockdown has just been the relief to to be able to talk to someone about how they've been feeling in person rather than than than, than virtually and I think one of the the anxiety and fears that are coming is will the NHS re-initiate some of the altered treatments, the stopping and cessation of treatments, and will the um, and uh, and and will a second lockdowns also put people back into shielding and having to, to to again lose that personal contact that they that they've been able to get back over these last um, couple of months? So it's a very daunting time ahead, knowing what people have experienced, and I suppose. This is a question for both John and Jesse. I mean, this is, I, I, again, I come back to this is a profound and extraordinary um, film. Jesse, what, what, what needs to happen next? What, what, what's, your, what's your hopes for this film? What, how do you think, just back to John's word, that we make sure that this isn't a forgotten sea? Um, well, I hope everyone if everybody who's on the call can help share the film that would be really helpful because <laughs> we've got our um our premiere next thursday um which because i talk a lot about um as john was saying which i think is a really interesting point actually about like the kind of young adults with cancer like there's sort of a kind of whole community of us on Instagram who which I guess is kind of almost the new blog like I think cancer blogging has been a thing for a long time mm. um but it sort of seems to have now moved on to Instagram and that's kind of almost like where people do their cancer blog um so there's sort of all these people that I'm kind of connected to who I've never met in real life but then share very personal mm. things with and it's been so nice to kind of share this with them and be able to 
kind of do the film um, and have them be a part of it and have them all see it next week. Um, but actually the other day someone um, said to me that it, maybe it would be a good idea to do a screening kind of in the House of Commons, um, House of Lords. And I think that would be amazing because I think, yeah, I, I just don't think it's been the response I don't know, it does just feel a little bit like, well, what happens? It, it, and I, I still don't really know what's going to happen with, if we do go into a lockdown again. Like, do we shield again? Will they? Will it be different? Will treatment still be stopped? Obviously, there's a backlog already. People were getting diagnosed still every day, more and more. Um, and it just all feels a bit, yeah, a bit uncertain, really. So I, I, I do think film can be a really powerful tool sometimes to use in that way for kind of like policy and advocacy so I think that would be my my dream <laughs> okay so we need to get it in front of um our health minister and prime minister and yeah. the whole, um, John um clearly you made um um the uncertain kingdom to shine a light on um some of the social kind of challenges within our United Kingdom and society um I, I, I mean, and I, I'll come back to sort of Jesse as about you know what what did you feel Maggie should do in in response to to this? But John, what what do you feel um, should happen next with this film? How do we help ensure that that cancer is not forgotten? I mean, I, you know, I as a producer, I'm constantly concerned about films being ripped off online and stuck up on. Uh, YouTube in, in various things, but with this film, I absolutely want everyone to rip it off yeah. and to <laughs> download it. And, so and uh, yeah, and you know, and the more people that steal it and, and watch it and you know, do re edits and turn it into memes and, and everything, I think the better. I, you know, I think it has the opportunity for a huge cultural impact, um, and it, it's worthy of that. Um, I, you know, but I, I also think what's great about the film outside of cancer is that it shows people communing with, enough, with one another and caring about yeah. one another across identity backgrounds, across, you know, all sorts of different, you know, it's, it is a really British film in terms of the types of people that are in it, the types of people who made it. And I think outside of cancer, if we can all look to our shared community um, and and not forget our, our shared humanity, um, despite all the troubles that each of us are going through personally and have a little bit of, you know, it's a bit, it's a very huggy feely thing to say, but I, you know, that, that poignancy that you feel in watching the film and that caring about other people, you can carry on into your, into your everyday life and, and damn it, you should. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I think, um, I think that's right. You're absolutely right. There, there was utter love, wasn't there, in this film? There was, um, and you could feel the love from all sorts of different angles. There was pain and and anguish, and um, and it, and it was harrowing. But, but I, I I agree, John, that, that the love has to sort of be the thing that shines through and sort of um, help engage us to kind of um, do the best for our fellow neighbour and, and sort of a human being. Um, so um, Jesse, what, what do you think Maggie should do in response to the to to this time and, and how people with cancer have been impacted? What do you think we can do to help um, shine a light on what your film has exposed? I was trying to think about that as you were um... <laughs> I think from my experience with Maggie's that it, it, it is about this, that, that safe space, I think. And I'd say that if this isn't even necessarily to do with the film, um, but I'd say if there was some kind of way of like keeping them open safely, if we were to go in something again so that people did have a 3D space to go to where they knew that everybody else there is going to be very conscious because everybody's kind of having to be because they're there because of a cancer connection. I think 
that would do wonders, I think, to have somewhere that you knew that wasn't just like if you were too worried to go outside to anywhere else and you couldn't because of shielding or going through treatment, but to have somewhere that's not because the thing is, I was literally going home hospital and that was it. That's the two places I went. And it's quite depressing when the only other place you can go to is the hospital. And I think if there was a way of safely keeping them open so that even just knowing that there was somewhere that you could go that wasn't your own house and wasn't the hospital, or even when you go to the hospital yeah. thinking, oh, actually, this doesn't need to be this horrible thing. I can actually maybe then come and just sort of be with people at a distance and just kind of be somewhere that's not the four walls of my flat. Um, I would say that's kind of Maggie's unique thing, I think, outside of other cancer charities. I'd well, say. I think um, as chief executive, I think I can say that that's, we're committed to doing that. And mm -hmm. when people were starting to come out of shielding and uh, they'd been seeing the centre staff um, virtually, um, actually Maggie Centre was often the first place that they came to because they saw it as a as a safe place, both in terms of COVID, but actually a safe emotional place to mm -hmm to test venturing out into the in, into the into the world and it's um i think the impact of shielding is is again one of those things that hasn't really been understood that transition from you know being locked down and fearful because of um on two fronts um both the cancer and on the, on the risk of covid and, and our centers that are in um places that have got sort of semi-lockdowns in Oldham and Manchester, um, they, they've continued to stay operational, being very careful, seeing people with social distancing and being very proper and very much with the support of the hospital, because I think they realise that, um, that the, the emotional distress and anxieties actually has continued to build up over, over time. So I'll make a commitment to you, Jesse, that the <laughs> is open and, uh, um, and through this time, and um, John, um, I mean, you've been an, an amazing and extraordinary um, friend and, and, and patron to, to sort of Maggie's. Can I just can I just be family? Can I just can we just call it family? Um. <laughs> well, I, think, I think that's exactly you are, you're part of the, you're, you're part of the family and, and, and Jesse, you're part of um, our, our Maggie's family. Um, I think you always knew how important psychological and, and, and emotional support was. Um, but do you feel that in, May, in seeing this film, do you think it's do you think it's it's highlighted that even more so? Yeah, I hope so. I mean, I yeah, I I mean, I at all the films I I I personally make as the director are all about communities and and the tension either between communities or finding your space within a community. And um, I, I don't, you know, maybe that's because my mum instilled in me the importance of that, you know, from a very early age. Um, but I, you know, it's uh, such a truism to say we're a social animal. Um, and I, I know how important that is. You know, we, we drive ourselves a bit crazy when we're forced into isolation and you know, yeah, I'm, it's all, I, I think the meaning of life is finding other people that you would do things with that you wouldn't do by yourself. Um, so, yeah, yeah, it is, yeah. And and the, the aloneness, so people with cancer often talk about feeling, it, it's not, it's not, it's not loneliness per se, but that feeling of aloneness, which again, I think, um, um, came through in the, in the film. And that's where the sense of community at Maggie's of, um, feeling that I'm, you know, I'm not alone. There are others going through this. Um, it is in itself um, a, a, a comfort without actually needing to be spoken, which is why I think the buildings and the spaces um, actually help support that kind of emotional uh, space. So, John, I've got one question from you. Is is I've been asked where they can see the whole set of films. Um, so you have a website, I believe. Yeah. Well, there's the. The uncertainkingdom.co.uk, he says, checking that it is. <laughs> it's either .co.uk. Anyway, if you look on iTunes or Amazon yeah. or the BFI website, um, you can find all the Uncertain Kingdom films there. They're in two um, volumes. Um, and it's, you know, I... You can either watch all the, each volume is about two hours long. Um, 
you, you know, you can be a real hardcore fan and, and watch all the films back to back or download them onto a phone and watch one at a time on the bus or, you know, when you've got 15 minutes here and there or put them on your big home screen and, and watch them all there. It's, you know, but, but Amazon, iTunes, the BFI, and I think Curzon Home Cinema still has them. I think, I think we've just posted the um, the, the link, so oh, great. hopefully yeah. everyone can can see that. Um, I haven't watched all of them. I've I've watched a good a good 120 hours worth of them, and they are both <laughs> inspiring, again challenging and 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 thought provoking. And um, so really, I don't think there are some of them that are all very funny as well. But <laughs> there are there are there are a few in there that have the good British sense of humour as well. So yeah, they're not all. And then, and then I've also got another question of what are you working on at the moment? What's next? For me or for Jesse? No, for you, John. Um, we are, well, with Isabel and uh, Izzy and Georgia, we're looking at setting up the Uncertain Kingdom as a, um, a one of the hardest things to do in, in film is to get money for script development. And so we're we're looking at pivoting the Uncertain Kingdom into a development program mm. uh, for up and coming filmmakers. Um, I'm, you know, I've, and then I personally have got lots of pots um, on the boil, well, on the stove, but none of them quite yet on the boil. Um, so yeah. Well, we well we well we we want to see more from you, and Jesse. I hope um, you're going to continue to keep writing. Yes. No, um, I thought, I don't, yeah, I, it's funny because I don't, this is part of the reason why I was like, I have to engage, or not engage Molly, that sounds weird, but why I had to collaborate with Molly is because I don't, um, I'm not really a fiction film sort of person, so it's like, or a narrative film, so it was an interesting thing to write, and I thought, I don't know, I thought I wouldn't like it, but then actually when we were on the shoot, it was like, it, there was, I've, I guess there was just such a high from seeing because we had such amazing cast and like seeing them kind of bring something that you've written and that's been in your head to life there is like no other feeling like that I think mm -hmm. um so maybe I'll be swayed <laughs> in more documentary stuff to narrative. Absolutely. um I'd like to just take the, the last minute just to um end to um thanking um Jesse for but for really, uh, I, again, as I said earlier, for allowing us to see and to feel um, the impact, and and I think John for highlighting that that we mustn't forget about um, cancer. And I, I'd like to ask all of those that you have joined tonight to um, um, to hear uh, from Jesse and John to to really um, support Jesse's ambition to make sure this film gets seen and known, and to make sure that. As I know you do, because you already um, support Maggie's. Um, make sure that that cancer doesn't get forgotten in in the midst of of this time of of COVID. So so thank you, John and Jesse, and um, and thank you everyone for coming and joining us tonight. It's been a real pleasure to to talk to you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.